get started because we don't have a lot of time. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Bronwyn Swinnerton and this is my colleague Taryn Coop and we're from the University of Leeds. And today I'm going to tell you about our ESRC NRF project that looks at higher education in South Africa and in England. So as I said, it's um, funded by ESRC and NRF. So we have a Cape Town team who are funded by the National Research Foundation in Cape Town and you can see the five members of the team there. We also have the Leeds University team which is funded by the ESRC. So the project started in October 2016 and ends for the Leeds team in November 2018, so in a couple of months' time. Even though we've put in one application, we have two different funding bodies and so the South Africa team have um, an extension on theirs until March, so we are going to carry on working together after we formally end in November. Um, today we're going to give you a background to the project and a little bit of the context and then my colleague Taryn is going to show you some of the maps, the interactive maps that we've created. So the project focuses on marketisation, digital technology and unbundling and we're particularly interested in the role of the market in higher education and how private providers are coming into the market of higher education using digital technology to unbundle some provision. And don't worry about unbundling, I'll explain what we mean by that in a moment. So if we look at marketisation, and the growth in demand for higher education has grown rapidly since the Second World War, and especially so in the last 30 years. And this, along with the financial crisis of 2008, has put a huge financial strain on universities. And so they're looking for different ways to bring in revenue. And one of those ways, obviously, is fees. And fees have increased to over £9,000 in the UK. And in South Africa, they've increased 9% per year in the period 2010 to 2017. At the same time, universities are becoming increasingly accountable. And rankings are very important. Things like REF and TEF are used to judge institutions. And at the same time, private companies are increasingly coming into the higher education landscape. So digital technology, we know that digital technology is ubiquitous in society and in education and especially in higher education. And there's a growth of online and blended courses. The edtech industry is estimated to be worth over $120 billion and it is expected to double in the next 10 years. And one of the reasons, many of the reasons um, there are many reasons for bringing technology into education. It's to widen access, it's to allow people who can't ordinarily come to a campus-based university to be able to do distance courses, people who work or people who've got caring responsibilities. And then we've seen one of the ways in which digital technology has really increased provision is through MOOCs. MOOCs have rapidly expanded in the last 10 years with um, global platforms such as Coursera, FutureLearn and edX. But is digital technology really widening access? Because when MOOCs first came out, they were free, open access. You didn't really pay for anything except for certification, whereas now they're increasingly monetized. You pay for credit. And now on future learn platforms, you pay for access for more than a few weeks after the course has ended. And you also, in order to be able to access such courses, you need a device, you need data or Wi-Fi, you need to have a certain level of digital skills and literacy, and that's not always the case, especially in South Africa. And so the third part of our project is looking at unbundling and how marketisation and digital technology has led to unbundling. And the term unbundling first arose in the computer industry when IBM started to unbundle its software from its hardware. And so instead of buying a computer with all the software already loaded, you then could buy each separately, so the software was unbundled from that package. And for us, unbundling is the process of disaggregating educational provision into its component parts, likely for delivery by multiple stakeholders, often using digital approaches, and which can result in rebundling. And an example of unbundled educational provision could be a degree program offered as individual standalone modules available for credit via an online platform to be studied at the learner's pace in any order on a paper module model with academic content, tutoring and support being offered by the awarding university 
or the universities and a private company. When Taryn shows you the maps in a few minutes, you will see some examples of unbundled provision in the UK. So the key questions for our project have been, well, where does the discourse of unbundling come from? And how is it used by the research literature, the policy literature, the media, and the interviewees? How do different stakeholders in higher education understand unbundling and rebundling? How is unbundling happening in practice in South Africa and, England, and in England? And that's what we'll be focusing on today. How does the intersection of unbundling, marketization, and digital technology change the pedagogies available in the higher education system? Which aspects of pedagogy and provision can be or are being unbundled and are marketized? And what is the nature of educational provision currently available in the UK and the South African higher education at the intersection of those three aspects? So in order to answer these questions, we carried out a range of different data collection with a range of stakeholders. So we carried out interviews with policymakers, ed tech developers, higher education leaders and private company CEOs. We also held focus group with academics, those people who are using those provisions for, for teaching and learning every day. And then we carried out surveys with students to find out whether students were aware of this provision and what they thought of the potential use of it in the future. We also used desk research to look at the relationship between universities and private companies. And that's where the, um, the data from that is used to make maps, and that is what Taryn's now going to talk about. So part of our project um, involved creating maps to present the partnering of uh, private companies with public universities to offer online education, unbundled, rebundled, or online programs. Um, and this just gives a bit about the theoretical underpinning of this. Um, social cartography specifically involves the mapping of ideologies, but it's the premises of social cartography um, that provide a rationale for, for visual, visualization techniques um, in this case. So for insights into relational trends across a context and for large amounts of data to be explored um, simultaneously. So what has become recognized as a subset of social cartography is tactical cartography which involves creating interactive maps usually using um, digital tools or digital software. Um, so our tactic or strategy involved designing the maps using our theoretical framework that uh, Bronwyn briefly explored to inform the scope, visual features and clustering options um, in order to reveal patterns for analysis. So for example, um, Bronwyn spoke about marketization, so in the theory around market making, um, in the higher education sector, um, there's exploration of the dynamics of ranking and uh, brands of institutions, and this is visually represented um, on our maps by including data from the Times Higher Education ranks, the historical status of the institutions, and um, university membership groups. Um, so just a little bit of the literature, uh, the connections between um, public higher education and the corporate sector for research, employment, outsourcing, services offered in partnership, and various other models of um, acad academy industry relationships are well documented. And in 2001, Anderson suggested that uh, more expansive views of these interconnections um, be captured, particularly through uh, visualization techniques and using social network theories. I um, mean, a number of authors have contributed to the space as well as a number of blog posts that have specifically spoken about um, online pro program managers and um, providers in the landscape, how, what business models they use and what type of um, certificates or degree they're providing. So the maps were made at the beginning of this year and then updated uh, last month. And everything on the maps was sourced from the public domain, from distance education websites, the university websites, the partner, partnering um, private company websites, and uh, press releases in the media. Um, the basic elements that you'll see on the maps are circles and squares and arrows. And the circles represent the universities, squares represent um, the private companies, which I will refer to as OPMs. And OPM stands for Online Program Management, I'm sure you know, um, providers. Uh, for example, companies like Pearson, 2U, Academic Partnerships, 
who provide a variety of services to do with managing online programs, such as market research, enrollment management, student um, retention, and sometimes technical support. Um, and MOOC providers offer a digital platform to host university content, but some MOOC providers are also uh, diversifying their services to become more like OPMs. So this discourse is debated, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to use the umbrella term OPMs to refer to these private companies, bearing in mind that the services range from a digital platform to different managerial services. Okay, so we have used shapes, sizes, colors, borders, and clusters to um, represent different uh, features or characteristics of the institutions and companies in the terrain. And we've done it all on a open source platform called Kumu, which um, is a data visualization specifically for relationship um, data. So I'm gonna show you one or two of the South African maps. They're static images from the interactive platform. And from there, we'll move on to the UK mapping, which is more the focus of this session. Um, and I'll show you that on the interactive platform. And just so you know, the maps and the underlying data will be made available at the end of our project. Okay. So this is a mapping of the relationship, as you can see, between the public universities and um, private companies, OPMs, in the South African space. So the circles represent the universities. They are scaled um, according to the number of students enrolled in each institution. Um, the borders around them represent the historical status of each institution. And this system of differentiation is quite debated and criticized for embedding historical disparities from the apartheid era in, in South Africa into today's discourse. But it is still used in po policy documents, especially around funding models. So, the dark borders represent the historically advantaged institutions that were privileged during the apartheid era. Um, the thin light borders represent the historically advantaged institutions with historically disadvantaged sites that came about as, as a result of mergers after apartheid. And the thicker light gray borders are the historically disadvantaged institutions, mainly located in poor rural areas. And institutions without borders are, are um, new in the terrain. So the connections between uh, squares, which are the OPMs and circles, are also color-coded according to what type of teaching and learning is provided through that partnership. So what we see here is the pattern shows that uh, the OPMs work predominantly with a specific type of institution, research intensive, historically advantaged institutions. The two exceptions are comprehensive or t more teaching focused institution and a research um, intensive institution that are both um, historically advantaged institutions with the historically disadvantaged sites. This distinction becomes clearer when we look at which research intensive uh, institutions do not have any partnerships and they are all predominantly historically disadvantaged um, institutions. So this is the same elements on the map just clustered in a different way. This is clustered according to the Times Higher Education rank, um, world rankings and the three highest ranked universities in South Africa, there are only three in the top 400 in the world, are collectively partnered with all nine of the private um, companies currently active in the terrain. So now I'm going to move on to the interactive platform. So this is the UK terrain, and you can see it's a lot busier, a lot more um, universities in the UK. So we have 166 UK public universities represented by the circles, color-coded according to membership groups. Um, Russell Group, Guild HE, Million Plus, the former 94 group, which um, disbanded in 2013. University Alliance and those that are non-aligned with any uh, specific membership group. They also scaled according to the size, according to the number of students enrolled at each institution. And there are 21 OPMs active in the terrain, and they're represented by the squares, color-coded according to which country in which they're established, and scaled according to the number of employees as a proxy for size of the company. 
So I'll take you through a few points of, points of interest that sparked discussion for our research team. So if we use the interactive techniques to highlight the Russell Group universities, um, almost all the Russell Group universities, that's 22 out of 24 of them, partner with at least one OPM to offer either MOOCs or online programs. And that's specifically what we're looking at in these connections, MOOCs and online programs. So not looking at short online courses um, in this map. Um, also, almost all former 1994 group universities, 12 or 14, partner with one or more. Um, OPM. And then when we go to those that are not aligned with any, any brand or membership group, less than a third of those universities um, partner with an OPM. So we see a pattern around the university's external brands um, and partnering with OPMs that are active in the terrain. Another option for clustering is the Times Higher Education World Rank, same as in the South African maps. And again, if we look at those that are not ranked, the majority of them also do not partner. There are some that do partner, but the majority do not. And same in the lower ranked universities. There are partnerships there, but it's not as dense as when we go to those in the top 300 in the world, which are, uh, it's dominated by the Russell Group and the former 94. And that's where we see most of the partnering happen, happening. Um, in the terrain. So next we're going to have a look at individual institutions um, as examples of how this uh, trend is unfolding and we'll also look at how we can use the interactive tools to sort of unpack the underlying features of each institution. So first we have King's College and they are typical of the, the pattern we've seen emerge. They are a Russell Group University, they are ranked in the top 100, 36th in the world. They partner with three companies, two to provide online programs and one to provide MOOCs. Um, and we have included the number of MOOCs and online programs that they are currently actively providing. So this is typical of what we see, the trend we see in the terrain. The next example is an institution that is atypical of the trends you're seeing. The University of Cambridge doesn't um, partner with any OPMs. Um, it is also a Russell Group University. It is ranked in the top 100, second in the world. Um, and it does not offer any MOOCs or any full online programs degrees. And, oh, it's getting stuck. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, and this could be for a number of reasons that we've discussed. Perhaps um, the high status, the high demand is already there. They don't want to dilute the brand. Um, perhaps their teaching model is more small seminars, but maybe that's something some of you will have ideas about afterwards. Why perhaps this is um, why the University of Cambridge isn't partnering, not going with the trend of other. Russell Group Universities. Um, our next example, again fits with the trend, the University of Lincoln. It is not aligned with any membership group. It is ranked quite low between uh, 600 and 800 in the world rankings. Um, it does not offer any MOOCs. It does offer a, num a couple of um, honours degrees online, top-up degrees, but not through any partnerships with, with OPMs. And our final example is another exception to the trend, and that's Coventry University. And Coventry is part of University Alliance, which is a membership group which represents institutions that specialise in technical and professional education. Um, Coventry, oh, hold on a sec. Coventry is not in the top 
universities ranked in the world. It's between 601 and 800, according to the Times Higher Education rank. Um, but we see that it partners with FutureLearn, and you can see by the color of their arrow, it partners with FutureLearn to provide um, MOOCs and online programs for on online degrees. And Coventry at the moment is the only UK university providing those full online degrees with FutureLearn at the moment. This is a snapshot from last month. So. Um, and the other uh, universities partnering with FutureLearn for that are Australian universities. So Coventry um, has been quite active in terms of teaching and learning, uh, unbundling teaching and learning provision in the UK. So they offer fully online programs with FutureLearn that can be taken module by module on a pay-as-you-go basis. And they, you have the option to take the MOOCs on FutureLearn and use those MOOC credits towards um, a full degree. So as we have showed you at the beginning, our desk root research was only one phase of data collection. And we have used uh, the maps to contextualize some of the evidence that we've collected through our other data collection phases through the interviews, focus groups, and um, surveys. But what we've hoped to illustrate in this very short time is how we've used the interactive mapping techniques to gain this panoramic view on, in two places, two national spaces, um, and how we've weaved our conceptual framework of unbundling marketization and digital, digital technology into a visualization through the um, visualization features and interactive clustering tools. Thank you. Thank you. So we're ready for, we've got a few minutes for questions. I've noticed the question of um, why are they moving around? People <laughs> want to know why the, why the map moves. Um, okay. <laughs> So this also has the uh, social network analysis capabilities. And what that does is try to find like points of power. So it will try and sort of jiggle them around and, and show you where a point of power is. Now we're not really looking at those measures in this project, but the reason it sort of jiggles according to, uh, like close to FutureLearn is because FutureLearn um, partners with almost 40 institutions. So that's a point of sort of power, so it jiggles around that point of power. It's, it's sort of like a, it's, it's called gravity on the software and you can change the, the um, amount of gravity, but yeah, that's what makes it jiggle. But I, it's just also fun. <laughs> yes. We knew we wanted to, um, like I had said, you weave our conceptual framework um, into, uh, into these maps. And a lot of social network analysis map, uh, mapping software is for very big data sets so that you kind of just see these little nodes and lines and that kind of thing. And we, our data sets weren't that big. We wanted to see um, individual things. So we, what was important when choosing the software was the dec decorative features so that we could use color and borders and that kind of thing. So that's, what, that's why we chose Kumu, because although it does have the um, social network analysis capabilities, you can run the metrics on it. It was just, it was a good option in terms of for a small data set having those very strong decorative features. And I'd just like to add to that, that when we carried out the interviews, that was where we came across um, CEOs of private companies saying, we want to partner with the top 200 universities in the world. And so that's where we started looking at ranking and types of university. So it was something that had come out of the earlier data collection that meant that that was the focus of how to um, put the variables into the mapping. Um, is this on? Yeah. Um, interested to get your, I appreciate it's not the kind of focus of your research, but to get your uh, insight into whether you think this is a, a trend uh, in terms of partnering with commercial organisations which is still growing and kind of where it is. Is it, is it something which you perceive that it is, is mature 
or is it uh, immature that, uh, and do you, you know, if you did this in five years' time, would you expect to see all of those unaligned institutions finding a, a commercial partner? Um, I think it's certainly immature, and we know that from the earlier maps, that when we created the mapping at the beginning of the year, it's changed already. So, for example, in the South African mapping, um, the University of Cape Town had no distance students, but they were creating provision that you thought might be for distance students, and now they've got some distance students. But in terms of leaving those non-aligned universities behind, I think that's a real risk. I think that... Yes, this will mature, and in five years' time, the landscape might look very different. But to what extent that will bring in all the universities, I don't know. This could really leave some universities behind. Thank you. Um, I wonder, in your interviews, especially with those universities that perhaps didn't fall into the higher rankings, um, whether there was a desire by those institutions to engage in partnering and if they actually saw any particular barriers to that or whether they were comfortable, in inverted commas, to stay where they were and not partner and just plough their own furrow? What we actually found from the interviews was that the more high-ranking universities were almost saying, we're fed up of people knocking on the door, we're fed up of getting emails, we're fed up of people ringing us up. But then you would get... The, the much lower ranked universities saying nobody wants to partner with us, we would love to develop this sort of provision. And we were at an event yesterday where somebody said this sort of provision needs a disproportionate amount of funding at the beginning and the lower ranked universities just don't have that amount of money. So if a private company doesn't come and help them do this, they can't do it. And so I'm not saying every university wants to do it, but there are certainly universities that are not being approached that would like to start developing this sort of provision. I'm just going to answer that. Yes. Uh, if you had to pick just one, what is the most important conclusion from this work? I think we're still working on that, but I think it's that private providers and private providers are really keen to work with universities that enhance their brand, that they don't just get the business, they get the association with the high-ranking universities. Um, another saw, very, sorry, oh, sorry, I saw another question, which is easy, that's what I'll take. The software is called KUMU, K-U-M-U. -U. So I'll just do one more question before we finish. Um, another, variable which, another variable which would be interesting is the size of the EdTech team at those institutions to see if that has an impact. That's interesting because at another presentation, somebody said, well, why aren't institutions putting ed tech teams together to do this themselves. And I think that means you've got to have the resource to do that. And you've got to have the skills within people who already work at that institution or be able to set up a team. And when the Digital Education Service at Leeds started, they had three or four, and now they're into 40, 50, 60, um, because the universities decided to allocate resources to that. And I think it would be really interesting to look at that, and we are really interested in other people's views of what variables we haven't captured on these maps. So I think, yes, that, and it, I think it would, you would find that the higher-ranked universities with more money would have bigger ed tech teams. And that has come up um, in discussion in our interviews, the sort of dilemma of build or buy, and whether that is possible or not, or to purchase or partner and arrange between that spectrum of purchasing and partnering, building or buying. Okay, thank you. We'll leave it there and we are around all afternoon if anybody wants to come talk to us. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.